So I want to start by bringing the voice of the natural world into our conversation here today. I don't mean literally like, you know, ha, ha, or, or, that was crow, barred owl, and chimpanzee, by the way, in case you were wondering. What I do mean, though, is to explore the relationship between our villages and the natural world, and in particular, rivers. So the best way that I can think to do that is to give you a little bit of a baseline of the way things used to be. So just imagine we were sitting here 200 years ago, 1812, there's a little war going on. Maine's not a state yet, but we decided we all want to go over to the banks of the Androscoggin River because there's this incredible spectacle going on there. There are all these fish working their way out of our lakes and rivers into the ocean. Just imagine we had some of us in the various rivers in Maine, the Penobscot, the Kennebec, the Androscoggin, and we counted how many fish were coming out of these lakes and rivers. How many do you think we'd count? Well, the answer is one and a half billion. Yeah, let me say that again. One and a half billion fish that used to come out of our lakes and rivers into the ocean. Just imagine actually counting that many fish. It would take a little while. But um, today, if we went over there, this would be the time of year to do it, by the way, we'd maybe find 1% of that many fish. Yeah. But there's some good news. We're beginning to reverse that trend. So let me just start by explaining the problem. How did we get here? It's actually a pretty simple story. Basically, we've, we've used our rivers to drive the development of our cities and towns. So you think about it, the first human settlement in Maine, probably the, the Penobscot and Passamaquoddy people, was on a river. The first European settlement in Maine was at the mouth of the Kennebec River at Fort Popham. And here we are, two great twin cities on either side of a river. And so basically they were great. You know, we could float logs out of the headwaters of Maine's forests. We could use the rivers to power our mills and to carry away our pollution. And we had incredible prosperity. There was a time in the middle of the 19th century that Bangor was one of the wealthiest towns in the country. But I told you the cost that that bore on the environment. And basically, there are two problems. One is we still have all this infrastructure. We've actually done a really good job cleaning up the quality of our water, in part thanks to Senator Ed Muskie, who's from just up the river here. So we have lots of clean water. But we still have all these obstacles for these fish to get back into their spawning grounds in the form of old dams. We also have a problem in how we think about this stuff. Some people will tell you that we can either have economic prosperity or a healthy natural world. Well, I don't buy into that. You know, and we've tried to solve the problem. It hasn't really worked that well, our solutions so far. So let me try to illustrate with an example. Two years ago, it was in June, I was sitting on the bank of the Penobscot River and I met this female Atlantic salmon. She had started her life in Ellsworth in a fish hatchery, spent the first two years in the hatchery, at which point the biologists put her in the river and she had this urge to go out to sea. So she headed down the gauntlet of the dams, the seals, the, the loons, the fishermen. She ends up in Penobscot Bay and there she sees other juvenile salmon and she's trying to figure out, okay, well, what do I do now? And she sees an adult headed out further. So they follow the adult, all the juveniles do. They go out the Gulf of Maine, past Nova Scotia, up the mouth of the St. Lawrence River, past Labrador, and they end up in Greenland because Greenland's got all this great food for salmon and krill. It's a great place to spend some time. She spends two years there fattening up because she knows that when she returns to spawn, she's not going to eat for another year. So on her way back, all the other salmon take off. She's now got a small school with her. She comes back into Penobscot Bay, up the mouth of the Penobscot River, past Bangor. By the way, what happens at this point is her kidneys completely reverse direction. You ever think about it? You need a very different biology to live in salt water versus fresh water. So she makes it up to the first dam, which is in Vizi. And there's, she's, but she's strong, she's persistent. She makes her way up the fish ladder, and there she runs into a trap. And you say to yourself, why are we trapping these fish? The Penobscot River has the best run of Atlantic salmon anywhere in the United States. And the reason we're trapping these fish is to actually try to take care of them. 
So we take these fish, we take them out of the river, we measure them and stuff. Here's what it looks like when we do this, by the way. We take them out of the river, we put them in a truck, and then we truck them up to the hatchery or past the dams. That's our current solution. So there I was, I said to this biologist, I'd really love to see these fish. Could you open the tank in the back of the truck? So he opens the lid, and all of a sudden this female goes shooting out the back. She comes out of the tank, off the truck, into a mud puddle, and he jumps down. He's just exasperated. He takes this beautiful fish, and he puts her back in the tank. He closes the lid, and that was the last I saw of this fish. That's how we're currently trying to solve the problems. But, there's always a but, right? Thankfully, we have a better example right here in Maine. And it's in part because of this gentleman right here. This is John Banks. He's the natural resource director for the Penobscot Indian Nation. And he, along with Scott Hall from one of the hydropower companies, they got tired of this either hydropower or healthy rivers debate that had been going on for a number of decades. And they finally sat down and said, let's pull together a group to figure out a better solution. And they did that. They bought environmental groups, state and federal agencies, and they started this conversation. How can we have a both-and solution? Healthy rivers, prosperous economies. And I was talking with John recently. He said, you know, Mike, these negotiations went on for about two years, and I was just sitting there, and I was thinking to myself, Phew, I don't know if this is going to work. And he said, one day I asked the group if I could have some time to address them. And so I, I got my bald eagle feather because bald eagles are the messengers between us and the creator. And I didn't know what I was going to say, but I knew that it would come through the feather to me. So I walked into that room. It was quiet. And I held the feather, and I walked around, and it came to me. And what came to me is to say to the group, it's not about you. It's about the river. And he said, from that moment on, the group figured out a solution, which is really a brilliant solution. And basically what it is, is the environmental groups and the Penobscot Indians are buying three hydropower dams, three of the most egregious, from the hydropower company, fair market value. And we're going to decommission them and remove two and do a bypass around the other one. But the hydropower company is taking the revenue from that, and they're actually increasing hydropower production on a side channel and on the tributaries. So at the end of the day, you have actually more hydropower, and you have 1,000 miles of habitat available to these fish. Here's what it looks like on a map. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a great story. I appreciate that. That, that does deserve applause. So this is a map of the current habitat available to migratory fish in Maine. This is the Kennebec River watershed right here, this Penobscot River watershed. These are the down east rivers. Those are the places that have the best habitat for migratory fish in Maine. So when we remove these three dams, watch what happens. Whoa, pretty cool, huh? Let's do that again. All right, here we go. Today, not tomorrow, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so what does 1,000 miles of habitat do for the fish, you might wonder? Well, it's a good question. And we have actually an incredible case in the Kennebec River not too far away. I, sh I showed you right there, the Kennebec River. We took out dams a decade ago, and the population of river herring, which is alewives, shad, and blueback herring, it went from a few thousand to three million in 10 years. So I was there a few years ago in May when the river herring are coming up the river at Benton. And the scene is a quarter mile of shimmering backs of migratory fish, two dozen bald eagles fat and happy sitting in the trees, <laughs> osprey right beside them, which never happens. Usually they're fighting for fish. And then there's lobstermen in the river with their nets just pulling out bait for early season bait so they don't have to get it from the Pacific Ocean, which is what they have to do when they run out. It's an incredible spectacle of economic activity and biological activity. I was talking with a friend of mine, and she said, Mike, one day I was down there with my boys, and there were 55 bald eagles down there. It was like they were flying in formation, you know, half a dozen at a time. That's what she said. It's amazing. So what's even cooler is that we have the opportunity to do more of this in Maine. I'm, I'm going to show you a graph here. I, I like graphs. Some people don't, but... Um, 
You know, here's a graph that shows you the largest watersheds in the East Coast, okay? These are familiar names, the Hudson River, the Delaware River, the Connecticut River, and then a bunch of main rivers. And the main rivers actually have among the largest watersheds anywhere on the East Coast. And the, bar, the size of the bar is the number of dams that are still in these watersheds. And what you see very clearly is that we have maybe 10% of the obstacles to migratory fish of all of these other East Coast rivers. So what that means is we have the best opportunity of every, any state in the lower 48 states to restore healthy, abundant rivers, which is pretty phenomenal. The only state, if we choose to do this, that would have more abundant, productive rivers, I think, is Alaska. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And we know how to do this. So why do I care? Well, it might be coming through already. I don't know. But, uh, you know, there are economic reasons to be sure, right? There's no doubt that this would lead to tens of millions of dollars of economic activity, particularly for the fisheries and for recreation. And then there's the community benefits. You know, I love the notion. I know some of you are teachers because I, I looked at the list. I love the notion of school kids in coastal communities going out in the springtime and looking at the fish in these rivers. I think it would be phenomenal and contributing to a database of how many are there. And then the community of the Penobscot Indians with whom I've had the great privilege of spending time and there is no more impro important project to them right now than this one. But then there's whew, the personal reasons. So I've had the chance in my lifetime to see three of the world's great migrations. One, wildebeest in the Serengeti. Two, sandhill cranes in the prairies. Three, fish in Maine's rivers. And when I was standing there with a scene like this, I didn't have my head underwater, but this is what it looks like. <laughs> it's just this incredible river of life flowing by. And all I could think about was, you know, at a moment like this, life just sort of makes sense. You just feel like you're part of the great mystery of life on earth. It's like John Banks said, we're definitely part of something bigger. And for me, this presents an opportunity to give back to all the things that I've gotten from this beautiful natural world. It's, it's an act of reciprocity. That's why I care so much about this. And so, as I sit here and I think about the fact that we have the solution, we have the opportunity, we can imagine what the world would be like if we had a both-and solution to how we manage our rivers, I ask myself, I ask you, why wouldn't we do this? May we make it so. Thank you very much.